Not enough food, no adequate housing. How do we effectively educate children who lack the necessities most of us consider to be so basic? Tonight, in Educating the Homeless in Nebraska, we'll discuss the challenges and support needed for Nebraska's homeless and near homeless students. Welcome to NET's Educating the Homeless in Nebraska. It's an issue many of us never encounter, homelessness. Yet the numbers of homeless students walking the halls of Nebraska schools will most likely surprise you. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg, and in the next half hour, we're gonna talk about the scope of homelessness in Nebraska and how our schools are dealing with the problem. We'll do that with four guests who each in their own way is focused on child homelessness or deals with it on a daily basis. You'll meet them in a moment. But first, let's put youth homelessness in perspective. One recent report shows this is a problem that at least nationally is getting worse, not better. In 2006, one in 50 children in this country was homeless. By 2013, the last year for which reports are available, that number had grown to one in 30 children, about 2.5 million homeless children nationwide. Our schools know this problem well, Kathy Monarchy of Sutton is Nebraska's homeless education liaison. By law, each state has this person who coordinates between the federal government and the state schools on homelessness. Well, welcome, Kathy. Thank you. Let's get a handle on the numbers we're talking about. How many homeless students are there in Nebraska and where do, where, where do they come from? Well, they come from all over the state. Um, there's over 3,000 children, homeless students in Nebraska. And we know that, of course, we don't find all of them. So that's the reported amount, um, and it's, it's statewide. We have 56 districts that report homeless students. The 11 districts that receive the McKinney-Vento grant um, have our largest amount of homeless students, but they're, they're spread throughout the state. And you would think Omaha would have the largest population. Is that accurate? It is accurate, and probably people would be surprised to know that Lexington as the second largest, and then Lincoln the third, and then it just goes on down from there. Um, Omaha has around 800, um, then Lexington has about 400, over 400, and Lincoln over 300, and then that varies throughout the year, of course. Well, wow, very surprising numbers. How does the federal government define uh, a homeless child? Well, it's based on your nighttime residence, and it has to be fixed, regular, and adequate and fixed meaning you go to the same place every night, it doesn't move around like a tent or a mobile home. Um, regular means you can go to that place every night. If you can go three nights a week, but for some reason you can't go Saturday and Sunday, then it's not regular. And adequate means, is it an adequate place for children to live? Um, are you living, are the children having to sleep on the floor because there's not enough room? Do they not have enough running water or facilities for children? Um, so if any one of those three things is missing, you could possibly be classified then as a homeless child. Okay, well, John Paul Gurnett teaches fourth grade at Liberty Elementary in downtown Omaha. He's on the front lines as a classroom teacher working directly with homeless students at times. Welcome to our program, John Paul. Thank you. You don't always know a student is homeless, so are there certain things that might tip you off or signs that you look for that this student might be homeless? Yeah, I think often we get that you know stereotypical view of what it means to be homeless, and I think as an educator, you really need to get to know your students well. Um, I know I've had students in the past where they didn't have a uh, a solid home life to where they were going from place to place. Maybe they were staying with mom's friend or they were staying with um, their brother's friend. And I just always listen to my students. And I want to always get to know um, what they were doing the night before. Often I'll ask, what'd you have for dinner? And asking that simple question really reveals a lot about that student. Um, I also think as educators, we need to do things like pay attention to our students' hygiene. Are they getting those basic needs met? And um, just from my experience, all the educators that I know, we're very compassionate and we know how to address those issues. We've built our school community to where we can support our students in every way possible. 
Well, we're glad to have State Senator Kathy Campbell with us as well. She represents District 25 in Lincoln in the Nebraska Legislature and is chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. Senator, welcome to the program. Thank you. Very we, nice. know, we know that child homelessness exists in Nebraska. How do you feel that the legislature has dealt with it in the past, and is it on the legislature's radar moving forward? It is on the legislature's radar. Um, Senator Mello from Omaha had this idea to put together an intergenerational poverty task force. And the task force has started this past summer of five senators and 15 uh, Nebraskans. And basically the Nebraskans are, are the people I consider boots on the ground. Uh, they work with a uh, population of people in poverty, of which of course the homeless would be there. I think we were so struck that the, Nash, the Nebraska average of children who live um, under the poverty level is at 17% of the children in Nebraska. And obviously of that statistic would come Kathy's statistics in terms of those that are homeless. So we are looking at this issue, trying to determine whether the public assistance that we're giving to families and ultimately to uh, the homeless, are they being spent in the best way? Are there best practices that we should be looking at? Well, good. Also on our panel tonight is Nikki Siegel, who brings a unique perspective. She's the director of outreach for the Bay in Lincoln. That's an organization that works with youth to provide them with positive activities and positive adult role models to help them succeed. Nikki, you bring your own experience to that work. Your own past includes times when you yourself were homeless. Can you briefly describe for us that situation when it happened? Right. When I was about 14, I um, ran away a lot and found myself homeless in many different situations and eventually went to live in group homes and become more to the state. Um, the state helped a lot and I, I eventually I grew up and went to college and then went back to work at the same group home that I lived in and started um, engaging in my passion of trying to help others that were in my same situation. Mm -hmm. And looking back on those times when you were a homeless uh, student at that time, what was your biggest struggle as a student? Um, my biggest struggle as a student would probably be just trying to fit in and then finding the adults around me that were positive that can kind of lead me in the right direction. Good. Well, Kathy Monike, I want to go back to you. So um, once you've identified, once the school has identified a homeless student, what happens next? Well, the first thing is to enroll them immediately. Um, and enroll means that they're actually in the seat in school, not just on the books. So even if there's two weeks left in the quarter, it doesn't matter. Those kids need to be enrolled and in school. Um, right away, because of their status as homeless, then they receive free lunch. They don't have to fill out any paperwork or anything. Um, and then they also qualify immediately for Title I services if the school feels that they need it, such as extra help, even if they don't. Um, you know, schools have to look at each student and identify who needs help. These kids don't really have to go through this. The homeless students could get help immediately. So once you know that, that student is homeless, the key is getting them enrolled right away. Right, right away and getting them in school because we know that's a safe place for them. They'll get a meal. Um, so we don't want to lose those kids, especially with the high school kids. You know, sometimes if they come to school and maybe feel like they're not real welcome or come back in two weeks, we know they won't come back sometimes. So mm -hmm. we want to get those kids in school immediately. Right. And John Paul, once you know that a student is homeless, as a teacher, how do you motivate a student to learn when you know that their basic needs outside of the classroom aren't being met? I think one thing I always try to do is create just a positive learning environment. And I want my students to feel safe at school. And one way I do that is by continually building up their confidence. Uh, I've had students in the past that I knew that my time with them might be limited. So in that amount of time, I had to show them that they could be successful in my classroom, but then have them realize the gifts that they have that would let them be successful anywhere else. Um, I also think that educators, we get these students who you know, they um, are going through different transitions in their life. We need to, when they are in your classroom, it needs to be a predictable and um, safe environment. I think, um, you know, if, if a student doesn't know where they're gonna sleep at night, they need to know that when they come to school, their day will be routine. There is nothing out of the ordinary. And I think also how you react to the students. I want my students to know that, I um, want my students to know my expectations and procedures and routines, but also know that I'm gonna treat them with respect and they're not gonna make me mad and I'm gonna react a certain way. So I think by 
creating, doing all those things to create that environment, we can really help our students be successful. And Nikki, is there anything that when you were in that situation that you, that a teacher could have done different to motivate you? Um, by not recognizing that I was homeless or um, not recognizing the things that were happening at home and not asking those particular questions, I think really affected it. And once I did find those teachers that really um, cared about what was going on outside of school, really impacted me in a positive way. So yeah. And how did you turn your situation around? Um, I think it's just by fate, just by the um, grown-ups that were around me that kind of believed in me and helped me succeed in life. Those are the most valuable people around you, yeah. Senator Campbell, you are chair of the Intergenerational Poverty Task Force, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, do you see child homelessness as a possible outcome of the overall problem of poverty? Is that how you, you kind of address it? Oh, absolutely. I think it's a part of that. You know, one of the statistics that has grabbed a hold, of, I think, of the attention of the members of that task force is we know that less than 50% of our foster children graduate from high school. and the statistics that we've been told nationally is that 25, less than 25% of homeless children ultimately graduate. The reason that that becomes important to us is that the chance that someone is going to live in poverty over an extended period of time or among generations is greatly exacerbated if you do not have a high school diploma. So when the education people say graduation rates count, all of a sudden, for the, for the senators sitting on that committee, we started paying a lot more attention to graduation rates because we know that it leads uh, to other situations for kids if they don't have it. And I think the difference between someone who has a high school degree and who does not in earning potential throughout their oh. lifetime is $200,000, I read. So exactly. society in the long run loses out too when these when these kids aren't developed. If, if they don't have um, a, a high school diploma, the chances that they will live in under 200% of federal poverty level is, is 57%. And if they have a diploma, high school diploma, it drops to 31%. And a, and a degree would drop them all the way to 12%. So how education and homeless work together is significant. And as far as the task force is concerned, do you see anything coming out of that specifically relating to child homelessness? Um, I would expect that it would. One of the topics that will be children specifically, and our report is due at the end of 2016, and we'll have a number of recommendations, but homelessness continues to come into the data and the people that come and talk to us. John Paul, what teaching methods do you use in the classroom to reach a homeless student? Is it any different than any other student in your classroom? Um, I'd say essentially no. I feel like I've built I go out of my way to build a good relationship with all my students, um, but those students that I know might be homeless or dealing with a situation like that, I, I do try to go out of my way to really um, have that positive, give them that positive feedback, continuously praise them for the positive things that they do, and um, praise their um, academic endeavors. Um, one thing that I really want to focus on as I continue to teach is um, what curriculum am I using? Am I bringing in um, literature that portrays people who might be homeless positively. I think um, as a society we have the stereotypical view, but I think for our children we can begin to present them um, different characters and books that may be facing similar situations and show them that these characters can triumph over adversity. So I'm, I'm just all about you know building that confidence and just um, helping them know that they, they can lead a better life. So every child in that classroom has some kind of struggle they're probably going through. It, this homelessness is just one of many. Yeah, um, my school, Liberty Elementary, we're in downtown Omaha, and um, we have a wonderful student population. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, but there are challenges that I think um, draws a certain type of educator. Um, your day isn't going to be spent teaching the content. Your day will be spent educating the child and helping that child become a better person. And I feel like among my students, there is that understanding that we're all we're all unique and we're all going through our, um, we're all trying to make ourselves better in um, different ways. So yeah, it was students dealing with poverty, students dealing with homelessness, and um, it's just a great community that, community that supports each other. Yeah, well very good. 
Well, if you're just joining us, this is an NET special, Educating the Homeless in Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg, and our panel for this discussion includes Kathy Monike, uh, Nebraska's Homeless Education Liaison, John Paul Garnett, a fourth grade teacher at Liberty Elementary in downtown Omaha, State Senator Kathy Campbell, who's chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, and Nikki Siegel, the Director of Outreach for the Bay Youth Program in Lincoln. Kathy Monike, I want to talk a little bit about homeless students in rural districts because we don't think about that often, but how does your job change when, you, you know, urban schools probably know how to deal with this problem, but rural schools maybe not so much? It's, it's interesting because sometimes, I, because part of my job is to make sure that the state homeless plan, that everybody knows what that is, each school district has to have a liaison, and in our rural areas, the liaison is almost always the superintendent. They have to have a policy, a district homeless policy, but sometimes they don't know what's in it. And so when somebody comes, people are becoming more educated as far as the public goes, as to the homeless, the McKinney-Vento homeless plan. And so they'll come to the superintendent and say, you know, we're a homeless family, um, we need help. And they call me and go, what, what are they talking about? What do I need to do? And so that's part of the deal. Um, also in, in the rural areas, it's hard because there's no shelters. So if they do get a homeless family, I mean, sometimes there's not even a motel. So it, it becomes very hard to house people sometimes. And you mentioned earlier about Lexington having the second highest population yes. in the state, which is a little bit surprising. Yes. Uh, how, why do you see that situation in Lexington? Because of the doubled up. Um, the McKinney-Vento Act has doubled up as a homeless um, category, which is different from HUD. And so if you're living with an aunt, an uncle, grandma, grandpa, or something, because of economic distress, then um, you can classify as homeless under McKinney-Vento. And so Lexington has a large population of doubled up. Nikki, you work specifically in the Lincoln area with mm -hmm. the Bay, and uh, it's not a case where you sit back and wait for these students to come to you and say, I'm homeless. You're actually out there on the streets trying to make the contacts, trying to find these students and help them. So when you do find them, what do you consider to be a successful outcome? Um, a successful outcome would be six months later having a stable living environment and getting them connected to the different services that Lincoln provides to them and getting them connected that way, yeah. And how closely do you work with the schools on a student? I work with um, all the counselors in the middle schools and high schools and get connected to the different counselors in the college areas just to get the kids connected that way. Um, I also work with um, the homeless liaison here in Lincoln, which is wonderful, and we just all keep connected with the different students that um, are at LPS and make sure that they're being successful. And when talking about success, John Paul, what do you consider a successful outcome in your classroom when you're dealing with a student who's, who's homeless? Well, I think for me a successful outcome would be that student comes to school every day and they're happy to be there. and. Um, they're developing a positive peer relationship and they are seeing that success that they can have when they try their best at whatever task they might have. Um, of course, I'd like to see them uh, continuing to return like they're here one semester, they're back the next semester. They, they I like it when they stay with us. For me, that you know is also success because no matter, they may be going through issues at home, but if they can still make Liberty, um, our school, part of their home, to me, that's successful. Yeah. Well, the National Center on, Home, on Family Homelessness puts out a report card on child homelessness and ranks every state. Nebraska's ranked second in the nation for our effectiveness in dealing with the problem just behind Minnesota. The rankings are based on several different factors. The extent of child homelessness, which they adjust for state population, child well-being, another factor is the risk for child homelessness, and state policy and planning efforts also go into that rank ranking. So Kathy Monarchy, what do you think we're doing better than other states are doing, at least according to that ranking? Well, one of the things we're doing really well is we rank number two in um, unaccompanied homeless youth having help fill out the FAFSA form to go on to college. And of course, that's really, as, as Senator, as you mentioned, I mean, that's the key. We have to get these kids educated to so that they can be successful. So that is an, just an awesome, Thing, I think for our state that we're number two in that. Certainly is. And Senator Campbell, did those rankings surprise you? Because state policy and planning is a part of what goes into that. There has been a, a lot of discussion in the legislative floor in the last couple of years 
on children, period. And it seems to me that one of the discussions that comes to play here is that in the formula that funds schools in Teosa, there is a poverty allowance. And while not every school district qualifies to have that because it's based on free and reduced lunch, I'm sure Kathy could give you more detail, but the discussion has been there because there's a number of ways that communities can submit a plan to utilize that money. And I think we're becoming much more familiar with what each community determines they need to have in their program. And I think that's key. I think that's what Kathy's talking about. Um, the other part I wanted to mention is it's so important to people to have people like Nikki testify at the legislature. Uh, we get a number of people on a topic, and we've had homeless uh, youth talk to the Health and Human Services Committee. That's critical because it underscores the importance of public policy for this. When you talk about funding, one figure I saw for Nebraska students, $53 per child to, to deal with the education of, of homeless children. Do you think that number is accurate, and how is that, how is that money spent? Well, a lot of it is spent for the liaison salary and for transportation because the transportation is huge. Um, another right that homeless children have is to be transported back to their school of origin, and that can be a tremendous expense. Um, Lincoln has done some real, real inventive things with that to help lower that cost. Um, but that is how a lot of the money is spent. It's also spent a lot in supplies, um, extra. That it can even be used for counseling for children who are in domestic abuse situations. So there's a variety of things that can be spent for, but the, really the largest would be transportation. Yeah, so if a student wants to go back to their original school, then that transportation has to be provided. It that does. Expensive. It does. It's, it's very expensive. Yeah. Hmm. John Paul, uh, as a teacher, you obviously work with these students in your classroom for eight hours a mm -hmm. day and hopefully for the entire year if, if they don't move out before that. Mm -hmm. does, does this get personal for you? Do you ever find yourself trying to step in and, and help them with some of the problems they're going through? I think educators always face that and we want to know what more can we do. Um, but I think for me, you do have to have that that distance and let let the family work on their issues. Let them you can refer them to resources definitely. Let them know that the help is out there. And I like to keep my focus on the student and knowing so the parents know that their their kids are with me for eight hours a day. So the parent then they have eight hours that they can take care of whatever they need to, whether that is to go look for jobs, look for housing. Um, I you know I've had students that. I found out that they were leaving, and um, we've had other colleagues be like, no, they can't leave, they have to stay here, they have to stay here. But I remember telling this uh, student in particular that you know, wherever you go, you will be fine, you are incredibly intelligent, and you'll do great. So I think that's how I make it personal for myself, is I make sure that I, if they are going to leave, leave me and leave my school, that I send them off with um, some words of encouragement. And Nikki, what about you? You work with youth as well. Does it get personal for you? It does. Um, I've learned throughout my years that it's really good to have boundaries, but it's also if you're impacting them in the way that you want to, then it's always going to be a little personal. And it's good that you take it that personal to an extent just so you really do look out for the best interests of the child, but it's good to have boundaries. And you were saying some of the youth that you work with, it can take years that you're working with them before they get in a place that you would call a stable environment. Right, yeah. And there's um, some people I meet when they're 15 years old and they're not really stable um, until they're 18 or 19. It just depends on the situation, but staying with them through thick and thin until their life um, gets into a more stable place is what they need from me, so that's what I'll provide. John Paul, when you see a homeless student, obviously some of them are going to succeed and, and some of them probably will get stuck in that cycle of poverty. Is there any characteristic or anything you can point to a student and say, that student has a better chance to succeed because of A, B, or C? Um, I think that's tough because I think it's, it's, you know, it is tough to, to overgeneralize our students, but um, I think if, hmm, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't have a, a great answer for that. Um, I think it is, you know, case by case, and I think, especially when dealing with homeless, it's, it, are the students living in a shelter or are they just living with grandma for the time being? And I think um, 
part of it is that parental involvement. Do, are, do the parents, do I know fully what's going on? Do the parents let me understand and um, refer the information to me? Are they telling me, oh, by the way, we're staying with so-and-so? Or am I completely in the dark? So I think the little more information that I have as an educator, um, I do feel um, a little more comfort with, comfort with that, that I know what the outcome might be. Um, but other than that, I really, there's really no predictive indicators as to um, a student's success versus another. Well, we're kind of running out of a little bit of time here, and I do want to ask you all one final question. So what's the one thing that, that we can do as a society or as a community to help students, homeless students in schools succeed, not in just in school, but in life? And Kathy Monarchy, we'll start with you. Well, I think we need to look at both ends of the spectrum. For one thing, we need to have really strong preschool programs for the kids because they're in situations where sometimes they they can't afford preschool, they can't get into a preschool, so we need that. And then on the other end, maybe a single point of contact at a college so that it makes a smoother transition for those kids going to college. Good. John Paul? Um, I think there's a lot of great resources out there and a lot of community organizations that help homeless youth. In Omaha, we have Completely Kids, which is an organization that has a shelter program. So they have counselors and after school volunteers that help there. Um, mentoring, like um, working with Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, they also do um, homeless youth match up with mentors. So I think just as a teacher, I. I feel really supported in what I do on the on the day to day, but what's happening to those students outside of my control, I really feel that that's where the public can help the most. Hmm. Senator Campbell? Um, oftentimes I think we look at this problem and we think this is intergenerational, but in reality for many homeless people it is situational in the sense that their car broke down and you know things begin to escalate for them. And if we on the policy can understand what programs do we need to put into place to help them with maybe that one problem or the second one that would keep them from being homeless, uh, those are the programs that we need to look at. And I hope that that's what we'll be doing over the next 12 months. Sounds good. Nikki, how about you? Um, I think just recognizing that um, there is homeless kids in your community and trying to find a way to connect with different wonderful agencies throughout the state and just get involved with that and kind of do your part, whether it's Big Brothers, Big Sisters or some other agency, I think we can all be a part of trying to help this. And Nikki, as somebody who's out there in the streets dealing with these problems face to face, are we winning? Are we making progress? Um, I think so. Yeah, I hope so. You have to be positive. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's great. And, and uh, that is all the time that we have for our discussion. I really want to thank everybody for being with us on this uh, NET special, Educating the Homeless in Nebraska. Uh, you can certainly watch this program on the web at netnebraska.org slash homeless. Thanks again to our guests, Kathy Monarchy, uh, John Paul Garnett, Senator Kathy Campbell, and Nikki Siegel. We really appreciate you coming out and talking about this very important topic. I'm Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.